Christ did receive together with Ms. Prayer. And we are for uh, free media advocacy. My Lord will receive a campaign for free expression, media monitoring, Africa Trust, and the South African National Editors Forum. Thank you, Mr. Tupinese. Justice, regarding the Yarin Hawa, carried together with my learned friend, Ms. Salome, for the democracy in action in case number 12070 of 2022, that is the application for the review of the summit. Thank you, Mr. Ngalwane. But I might say that, you know, I don't remember seeing the papers for democracy in action. So the democracy in action will be cited separately. In other words, because uh, as Mr. Duplessis has indicated, I do have the other three applicants campaign for free expression and the other two, but I don't have papers for democracy in action. And you say the, the case number you quoted, that is uh, Ms. Mahon's case. Mm. I don't know, but that file, this is the file. Maybe your junior can peruse the file and see whether that set of papers are here in the court file. And if they are not, we can maybe see how we can resolve that. Thank you, Mr. Bofa. Thank you, my lord. Um, my lord, just on that note, I should then probably apologize for um, Ms. Palmer's absence. You would have seen that her name is also in the head, but for happy health reasons, she's had a child recently, and so she can't be with us. Yes. But, um, I do the same. My lord, it has been agreed between us as the council team that issues around the questions of preliminary skirmishes on urgency and combination and so on we don't wish to detain the court, obviously we will wish to attend in that regard, but we certainly as the parties we wish to get on with the matter, the Lord is, is willing to um, allow me to proceed immediately to the argument. The Lord, in that context, uh, the Lord, yeah, Lord, sorry. But maybe we need to sort out the papers for Mr. Ngalwane first, so that we we'll try and find what is happening. We will wait for him. Thank you. Yes. yes. Maybe what we can do, if you do have a separate set, you can hand it over to me and then we can proceed. And then later on we should try and find them.
Yeah, just peruse them to satisfy yourself that uh, they are there. But of concern, even your heads of argument, I don't remember receiving. It seems Mr. Mboff is of the view that uh, maybe we can dispense with your heads of argument. <laughs> Yeah, no, I will insist, despite what Mr. Boffo is saying, I'll d I'll insist to, to have a copy. <laughs> okay, thank thank you, thank you. So, um, as I began my address, I stressed that I appear to be with Ms. Kreya for what I'm going to be calling the media amity. So. Campaign for freedom of expression, media monitoring, Africa Trust, and SANA is a national editors for So we, we take it, Mr. Duplessis, that uh, the matters are, well, not maybe officially consolidated, but they are head together. Yes, we will. I think we're all here together. And we you agreed on that, Ms. Hofwe. Indeed, my lord. Thank you. Yes. Mr. Mbofu, we agree on that, that uh, the matters are head together, although not maybe officially consolidated as one matter, but they are head together. Yes, my lord, we're in order. That, that would be in order, my lord. In any event, the judge president, my lord, consolidated the main application. So mm -hmm. it's, it's in order that they could be held together, this, this, because it's, it's basically interlocutory. They relate to the main application, yes. Processes. Thank you. And Mr. Ngalwane, sorry, again, you confirm that although there are separate matters, different case numbers, but they are held together. Absolutely. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Tupilis. Thank you, my lord. My lord, so <coughs> my lord would, in the flurry of um, heads that have been filed, um, my, my lord would know that this case was originally before the court on the 10th of October, my lord, and at that point prior to the hearing, um, the media and the key had already filed main heads. Those are going to be described by me in my oral argument as my main heads, and they should hopefully be in my lord's files. We've also filed brief supplementary heads, my lord, and those hopefully are also in your file. And to the extent that they're not, I will hand a copy to my lord. Well, I so do have a copy. Oh, good. That's excellent, my lord. And then in those heads, if I might just stress for my lord, <coughs> there is reference to a judgment of the Constitutional Court, and my lord would have seen it referenced by at least my clients, and certainly um, I think as well Democracy in Action, or you wouldn't have seen it because you haven't seen their heads, my lord, but they do reference it. And it's the Mineral Sands case. And just for my Lord's benefit, we thought it would be helpful to hand a copy of the judgment just that my Lord has it, because I think all parties may well reference it. Um, to the extent that any of my little friends might need a copy. So, uh, just a minute again, Mr. Duplessis. Yes, please. I take it that uh, uh, Miss Mahon and Mr. Downer, in these proceedings, they are not separately or they are not really represented? No, no. They're not they're, represented. They are not, yes. Ms. So that one situation, my Lord, there was an application brought first by Ms. Moore, and her application was to set aside the summons that had been issued in respect to the private prosecution. There's a separate application that had been brought by Mr. Downer and he seeks similar relief. Yes, I'm aware. But they were, they were, they were set down, Ms. Morn's case, my Lord, was set down very urgently for hearing uh, on the 10th of October. Mr. Downer's application was set down um, slightly more luxuriously for us. I think it was today, well, December. And that's where you can now find the cases effectively between those two days that come before my Lord. And my Lord, just so that... Um,
Okay, thank you, Mr. Lara. Yes, you may proceed, Mr. Duplis. Th thank you very much, my Lord. Now, Lord, we have, with those preliminary issues out the way, Lord, we have three parts to our oral argument. And if I just give you the overview very briefly, my Lord. <coughs> Firstly, we will deal with the process for amici admission. And in that context, we will also speak about Mr. Zuma's election to oppose by way of a Rule 65D3 notice, which my Lord will see on the papers. Secondly, we will then turn to look at what we claim as the media applicants on their behalf, <clears throat> that they clearly meet the substandard, the substantive standards for admission of MEP. And we say that is even so on the version that we've now read from Mr. Zuma. In fact, particularly so because of what Mr. Zuma said in response to the media applicants' application. So first is process. Second is the substantive test, which we say we have met for. And then third, I'm going to deal very briefly with the core arguments by Mr. Zuma on the merits. Um, and I'll deal as well, right at the end, just quickly with the issue of costs. Depending on what might happen during the argument, I, I won't be long on costs. I'll have to hear from my learned friends before we make up our minds on the issue of costs. But on the point, this third point that I'm stressing about the core arguments by Mr. Zuma, I'm going to be brief, my lord, you'll be happy to hear, and I'm going to be brief on those arguments, because with respect, this is not the forum to determine whether our arguments as the amici are correct, or Mr. Zuma's arguments against the amici are correct, because that's not the test. The test is merely whether they are relevant, whether the issues that have been raised by the amici are worthy of consideration and might be of assistance, obviously, to the court hearing this matter uh, in March next year, which I understand is a full court. So the question isn't whether we are right or whether Mr. Zuma is right, or whether we are wrong or Mr. Zuma is wrong. The question is merely whether we have raised seriously important questions which are going to be of assistance to the courts uh, who hear this matter on high. And with respect, we say one would also appreciate, my Lord, that this case is likely not to end necessarily with the full court. It's, it's, it's likely that in consideration of the importance of the issues, the matter may well go up. And so therefore the importance of amici attempting to assist the courts in such an important case, we say, would be obvious. So those are the three points I wish to deal with. Lord, let me go immediately to process, which I said was the first issue I want to touch on. The Lord knows that the main application in case number 12770 was brought by Ms. Morn on the 20th of September, and there was a Rule 16A application uh, that was filed, or Rule 16A notice, rather, that was filed, my Lord, and the next day by her. So there, in the usual way, as my Lord knows, in matters involving important constitutional questions, the Rule 16A notice alerted the parties to these issues. And my Lord, that notice said that the amici, any interested amici, had to bring an application for admission by the 3rd of October. I'm just pointing out, my Lord, that that was truncated, because in Morn's case, as I might call it, the hearing was going to be very soon thereafter on the 10th of October. And that's why that timetable was so tight. And my Lord, in that context, that timetable was met by the media amici, or the timelines were met by them, and they dutifully, dutifully I should say, uh, applied timelessly for admission. Now my Lord, in that context, again under process, Mr. Zuma's legal team filed a notice to oppose but no answering affidavit in response to Ms. Morn's case. And instead, uh, Mr. Zuma's legal team elected to file a Rule 65D3 notice on the 4th of October. And quite correctly, we say our learned friends in the heads for Mr. Zuma at paragraph 1 say, my Lord, that, and my Lord may have seen it, Respondent Mr. Zuma will first and foremost, sorry, my Lord, I should wait for you to get there. It's the first paragraph of Mr. Zuma's heads. Yes. You'll see it's said at the bottom of the page the respondent Mr. Zuma will first and foremost oppose the applications based on the preliminary legal grounds raised in the notice in terms of Rule 65D3, which was delivered on 4 October in respect of the application for campaign for free expression others. In other words, our application, the media amici. Uh, application. And my Lord, that, as I say, is a correct statement by Mr. Zuma to have said that they will be 
opposing our application on the basis of the Rule 65D3 notice. It's an important consequence arising from that election because my Lord knows that if you file a Rule 65D3 notice, but you don't file over an affidavit and deal with the aspects, then the case law says, and my Lord knows this, then the allegations in the finding affidavit must be taken as established facts by the court. So the Lord knows that. I can say that happily because my Lord and I debated it, I think it was last year in a case where I appeared before my Lord, um, in Cross and Strawberry Works. And my Lord will recall in that case a Rule 65D3 had, had notice had been filed, no answering affidavit had been filed. And my Lord correctly, with respect, relying on Boxer Super Scores, an SCA judgment, um, of his Lordship Mr. Justice Cameron and a case in this division APSA Bank versus Bianca Cara Interiors found against me and with respect correctly the SCA upheld the Lord to say that if you file a Rule 65D3 notice then you're not permitted to without very good cause file an answering affidavit the facts in the filing affidavit in other words are then the facts upon which the matter must be adjudicated so my Lord Having made those process points, um, let me just say that we, we anticipate that Mr. Zuma may say, well, he has, a, he has attempted to file a comprehensive answering affidavit, and that that came very recently. Well, with respect, my Lord, the election was made that the Rule 65B3 notice is the opposition, and rightly, as I say in his heads, Mr. Zuma says in paragraph one, that is their opposition to us. But in any event, my Lord, even if you have a look at their answering affidavit, you will see that the answering affidavit in no way by Mr. Zuma traverses the factual allegations that are made in my client's affidavit for admission as amici in this case. So there's simply no contestation at all with those factual allegations. So my Lord, whether on boxes, super stores, which says that Rule 65D3 notice alone means that the allegations in the filing affidavit must be taken as established facts by the court, or whether one wants to look at the answering affidavit by Mr. Zuma, there are no contestations in relation to those allegations in the filing affidavit by Mr. Zuma. And those are very important preliminary points I'll make because of what I've come into. Yeah. So, my Lord, with those pro that process heading out the way, I'm glad to say that t didn't take long. I can now move a little more into the second topic, which is why we say the test for admission is, with respect, easily met by the media amici. My Lord, you will hear from our learned friends, they will cite various cases of the Constitutional Court, and we have cited various cases of the Constitutional Court which set out the test that the Constitutional Court, as it turns out, has established for admission of amici. My Lord, we will suggest to my Lord with respect that between us there's actually very little difference. I'm going to highlight that the core requirements for the admission of an amici come from whether it's their cases or our cases. But I do want to stress, my Lord, a number of important features from the authority which is important for my Lord to keep in mind at the outset. And if I would ask my Lord to turn to the heads of argument, our main heads, as I said, I'd call them, at page 16. Yes. Sorry, my Lord, at, at paragraph 16, page 10. Paragraph 16. No, pa pa page 16. Yes. And paragraph 10. And you'll see at paragraph 10 the Constitutional Court's judgment <coughs> in Koyabe. Yes. And my Lord, the citation is there, but the paragraph I want to just lift out for you says that it can be no call with us by our learned friends. Constitutional litigation by its very nature requires the determination of issues squarely in the public interest. And then you'll see at the bottom of the page we've quoted, Amici introduce additional new and relevant perspectives leading to more nuanced judicial decisions. And their participation in litigation is to be welcomed and encouraged. Lord, the next point just to stress for you 
is, again, on that page, I'll ask you to keep the page of the heads open because I'm going to reference one or two other cases there. But the next point is just that paragraph 11. You see, the role of amici is to draw the attention of the court to relevant matters of law and fact to which attention would not otherwise be drawn. And I'd ask the Lord just to underline those passages because I'll come back to speak to how we certainly, as the media amici, do just that in this case repeatedly. And my Lord, <coughs> it's also important, we say, then to understand that there is a default position that the Constitutional Court has laid down. And that is to encourage amici involvement. To encourage clients like my clients to assist courts where they can. Particularly, my Lord, in cases where, and I'm already now getting into the requirements, where those cases involve important constitutional questions, where there are novel questions that are involved, and where the amici make arguments that are different to those of the other party. And I'm going to come back to those four requirements in a moment. But before I do so, let me just draw attention, with my Lord's leave, to two other features that underline the importance of admission of the media amici. So I'm talking about just my clients at this point in time. Other amici can talk for themselves. Two particularly important features, my Lord, that underline the importance of my client's admission. First is this, my Lord, at paragraph 12.4 of that set of heads that I asked you to look at earlier, so at page 17 of our main page, the heads, paragraph 12.4. The following is said, my Lord. It said that the amicus applicants have extensive experience regarding the right to freedom of expression and press freedom. They are well placed to provide submissions of assistance to this court in the issues, and in particular, to speak to the chilling impact of such summons on freedom of expression in the media and journalistic activity. Their position is akin to an expert in the field, which warrants consideration by the court. And my Lord will see that they, um, in that context, in our filing affidavit, they have made very clear their expertise. And if my Lord goes to the filing affidavit for my client's admission, the amicus papers in the papers, I have them at volume four, and they are separately numbered as the amicus papers, my Lord. But if my Lord goes to our filing affidavit, that's the media amicus filing affidavit, you'll see the following said at page five, paragraph 12. This is on the topic of their expertise. Being akin to, as we've said, experts to assist the court. So my Lord, at paragraph 12, you'll say, we say, or my clients say, in doing so, the applicants for admission to intend to draw on their extensive experience regarding the right to freedom of expression and press freedom, both in respect to the ambit of those rights as well as in respect to how to strike an appropriate balance when faced with other competing rights and interests. And just, my Lord, for completeness, this is important. If my Lord goes further in that affidavit, at page 7, I have it, of the index papers, at paragraph 22.2.2, just as an example, you'll see at 22.2.2, there's a discussion of who these applicants for admission are. And my Lord will see in the final papers, it describes, for instance, Media Monitoring Africa. It describes all of my clients, my Lord, but just as an example, Media Monitoring Africa. MMA has participated in various court cases relating to freedom of expression and other information rights, and has through litigation, research, and advocacy engaged in extensive work on issues pertaining to the appropriate balance to be struck between freedom of expression on the one hand and other competing rights and interests on the other. Now, what is the point I'm making, my Lord? The point is an obvious one. You have before you, in the media amici, you have parties who have extensive experience in this particular field about these particular rights and how to balance them. And not only that, my Lord, they have litigated in this field extensively, as an example. And my Lord, on the Boxer Superstore's point, what they've said about their expertise is uncontested by Mr. Zuma. It couldn't be contested anyway, my Lord, because clearly they are known and have appeared in other matters precisely for the reasons I've given. So that's the first point, my Lord. Their expertise is uncontested, and no doubt in a case of this importance, we say they would be of assistance to my Lordship's brothers or sisters who might be hearing this case in March. Now, my Lord, the second point I wish to stress is this. 
the media amici intend to rely, my Lord would have seen it, on United Nations and other international reports of credible international organizations and rapporteurs. And my Lord, in that context, the Constitutional Court, no less, has welcomed precisely such reports in its judicial decision making. The first place to see that is again in our heads. I've asked you to keep them open at the page you were at, my Lord, but if you go to the next page, page 18, you were reading previously from 17, and 18 you'll see Karunda, and where the Constitutional Court said this about the International Bar Association and Amnesty International reports. Do you see it, my Lord, in paragraph 13? Yeah. It said, whilst this court cannot and should not make a finding as to the present position in Equatorial Guinea on the basis of those reports, it cannot ignore the seriousness of the allegations that we made. And then, important words, they are reports of investigations conducted by reputable international organizations and a special rapporteur appointed by the United Nations. And Lord, you can underline those words too because you'll see my clients want to reference similar reports by the international organizations and by special rapporteurs by the United Nations Human Rights Committee. And you'll see that the court goes on to say, the fact that such investigations were made and reports given, my Lord again can underline, is itself relevant in the circumstances of this case. So immediately my Lord will be thinking, well, in what way might Amiki be of assistance in the case that will come before the court in March? What would be relevant? Well, the Constitutional Court tells you these types of reports would be in themselves relevant in that context. Now, my Lord, coming a little closer to our case, and I handed up to Lord Mineral Sands earlier. <coughs> if the court goes with me, that Mineral Sands judgment, I hope my Lord has the top yes. of the hand, paragraphs two, immediately right at the outset of the judgment. And the court is going to see from us that mineral sands is of help in numbers of ways, but right at the beginning, just so that you can appreciate what was in issue in mineral sands. And this is a judgment of three weeks ago by the Constitutional Court. It said at the heart of this case lies the phenomenon of what has become known as SLAP, Strategic Litigation Against Public Participation Suits. The court says it has been described as lawsuits initiated against individuals or organizations that speak out or take a position on an issue of public interest, not as a direct tool to vindicate a bona fide claim, but as an indirect tool to limit the expression of others and deter that party or other potential interested parties from participating in public affairs. So the first and obvious thing to say, my Lord, is that here you've got the Constitutional Court just three weeks ago dealing with the SLAP case and telling us what the law is, developing it in a context which is slightly different to what is before the Lord and what will come before the full court in March, but setting out the principles in great detail as to how one must accept the SLAP methodology as part of South African law. And have a look while you're there, please, with me at paragraphs 4 and 5 of the, of the judgment. In that case, too, just like in this case, two amici sought to be admitted. The first was Kells, and you don't need to read everything, Lord. You can simply go a little midway down the page, you'll see the sentence at paragraph 4. Kells made written and oral submissions in this case. Doing what? Setting out the nature and treatment of slap suits in foreign jurisdictions, focusing primarily on the tests in foreign jurisdictions to identify and address cases presenting as or alleged to be slap suits. I'd ask you, Lord, to recognize when I come to you explaining our submissions, that's precisely what we wish to do as the media amici in our matter. And then you'll see at the bottom of paragraph four, the court said this court is indebted to Kells for its helpful submissions. So we, we say with respect, that is exactly the sentence that would be written by the full court in March after our submissions have helped it arrive at what I stressed earlier is a more nuanced decision. The Constitutional Court speaks about Amici helping the court to arrive, not necessarily at their argument as being the right one, but at a more nuanced decision. So, my Lord, that's paragraph four. Have a look at paragraph five of that judgment. Again, it's very helpful. A second Amici was admitted. It was the Southern African Human Rights Defenders Network. It tells us all about them, my Lord. And then if you look at the top of the next page, it says that Amici's written and oral submissions centered on international law with the aim of ensuring what? That the broader context of international law is taken into account by this court. 
In particular, they sought to ensure that the court considered international principles that promote the ability of human rights defenders to participate in public interest issues that may involve litigation. Again, we see the court saying their submissions were helpful to the court for which we are indebted. So, you know immediately from that judgment that in this particular space, the idea of slap suits, which my clients were the only party, it wasn't Ms. Morn that raised the slap suit as a potential aspect to her arguments, it was my clients that brought attention to that. You know that the Constitutional Court has said that that type of assistance is helpful, and you know that it is helpful when? When attention is drawn to international law instruments, which is what we intend to do, and where foreign comparative jurisdictions are also drawn into the mix. Because these are, these are important questions, but they're also intricate questions. The court needs the assistance and learning of other places. And how does it get that learning? It gets it from the amici. I can't put the case down a lot without just giving you the very final paragraph of the Mineral Sands Judgment, because it really puts the point to rest emphatically in favor of the media amici being admitted. It's at paragraph 100 of the judgment. And I, it, it's important if, if my Lord has a chance to go there. Right at the back, under the heading conclusion. <coughs> Lord sees that slap suits appear to be on the increase <coughs> here, as is the case globally. And how did the court know about that global recognition? How did it know? My Lord sees paragraph, uh, footnote 92. If my Lord goes to footnote 92, which is right at the back of the judgment, you'll see the info note on slaps rights of the United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Rights to Freedom of Peaceful Assembly and Association. Kiampi records that slaps have been seen as significant increase worldwide. We were prescient, my Lord, as the media amici. Before this judgment came out and referenced that, we'd already admitted, or applied rather, to be admitted as amici. Our heads had already been filed. What was one of the particular reports that we said we wanted to draw to attention for the court's benefit? That report. Of course, there are others too, but that report, we'd already, as I say, presciently recognized that it may be of great assistance to the court. You now know from the Constitutional Court's own judgment, which came just a few weeks ago, that it agrees with us. Those types of reports are important. So, my Lord, we also know from Mr. Zuma's case that international law and these types of reports are important. We know that from his answering affidavit, because Mr. Zuma's answering affidavit that was filed, not in our case, because he hasn't filed one in our case in, um, in, in any way that meaningfully engages with us, but in his main affidavit in the Morn case, and the Lord, that would be, I don't know what the Lord's volume is, but if I can just give you um, the, the paragraph of the answering affidavit, it's paragraph 114. Paragraph 114 of Mr. Zuma's answering affidavit under conclusions says this. It says, there is a host of international legal instruments and comparative jurisprudence that deal with the right to privacy in relation to medical information. We understand Mr. Zuma obviously wants to focus on the, what he contends is the breach of his privacy rights. But you'll see that they are saying there's a host of these types of international legal instruments and comparative jurisprudence that deal with it. And then they go on. Well, they say, at the hearing of this application, the hearing of the application in March. Such references will be made available to further demonstrate that there is no superior constitutional right to the media in that context. So our learned friends are quite happy to want to tell the court about international law. They tell you emphatically under oath that they will be doing so at the hearing. It seems only appropriate for the court to then have a balanced view about what the full panoply of international law is and which of course my client wants to draw to the court's attention. I stress not because we say we are right or that they are wrong. They can't make any claims, neither can we, about the rectitude of these arguments. They are balanced, they are nuanced. And they are not for my Lord to determine. They are for that court in due course to determine. But that they are important and that they are out there, we know from Mr. Zuma's own answering affidavit, as I've just read to you. So with those two features, just a minute, Mr. Duplessis. Should I understand your submissions to be uh, dealing mainly with the part of the summons alleging that Ms. Mahon 
uh, disclose confidential information? No, I'm dealing with all of it. So, my lord, the summons in itself, our arguments, I'm going to show you the relevance of each of our arguments. Our arguments overall deal with the fact that there's been an abuse of process by issuing the summons, that there is... But, but, yeah. but how do you see the abuse of the process if there is a, a reasonable and probable cause to prosecute Ms. Mohan? Well, that's the debate. Is there a reasonable probable cause? Of course, Ms. Ms. Mohan says there isn't. Her entire application is to suggest that there's no reasonable or probable cause. And that debate obviously is going to be ventilated in full before the full court. Our arguments, will Lord, go to a different point. It's but but, but it's what I want to understand, the context of your submissions, what contribution will be made by the media applicants on the issues raised by Ms. Mahon, for instance, that uh, uh, for instance, that the Nolle prosecute does not refer to her? No, no, that would be a Nolle prosecute point. That would be one of the procedural points. What we would be saying, so that we know that Ms. Mahon's fight is in numbers of respects. One is she says there's no Nolle prosecute. The other is she says it's an abuse of process. Uh, but yes, ma'am. But yes. you, so your clients are addressing themselves on the issue of the abuse of process. Abuse of process, well, Lord. Abuse of process, absolutely. And secondly, the interpretation. But what, I, of what I'm trying to say is that it seems to me, if, for instance, Mr. Zuma fails on the issue of a reasonable and probable cause to prosecute, then you don't have to deal with the question of abuse of process. No, but my lord, when will he fail? He'll only fail later in the trial. The, the, the very purpose of a slap suit is to put somebody to the expense and time and trouble of a trial. And the Constitutional Court has now explained that what you recognise in a slap suit is that it's meant to burden somebody unfairly. And the international law points that we wanted to help the court understand, in particular, is that the UN Special Rapporteur said these types of slap suits that are being brought, particularly against female journalists who are reporting on corruption. That's just one of the examples, one of the numbers of others. These types of statutes are on the increase. And the way in which the international lawyers who are assisting the UN Special Rapporteur are highlighting that these should be dealt with is that they must be stopped at the outset, that they should not be, in other words, allowed to continue any further. That's the first point or that they should be discouraged by punitive costs. Awards. Those are examples. The point is that abuse of process is one of the features of our argument, absolutely. And separately to that is also the interpretation, of course, of Section 41, uh, 41 6 of the NPA Act and what that means. Those are where our arguments are focused. We are not dealing, as the media amici, with the question of the nolly prosecute. That's, that's not where we focus on. And in that context, um, you will appreciate that what we are really focused on is whether the exercise of power or discretion by Mr. Zuma in the role of a private prosecutor to decide to bring a case against him, whether that power was exercised properly or abused. That's one question. But it's not really a question that's outside of these parties. It's a question for the court. Because as the Constitutional Court has now said in the Mineral Sands case, it protects itself. Of course, it recognizes that it's protecting others, but the reason an abusive process doctrine exists at all is that it protects itself as a court from being used by a party for a nefarious purpose when there is, in fact, no good reason for it. That's what a slap suit ultimately is. So, my lord, with those features in mind, um, I turn next to the core requirements for our admission. And as I said to you earlier, all the parties have cited different judgments of the Constitutional Court. All of them, however, ultimately conduce to the following core requirements, which you will see extracted um, from them when you read them in your own time. They are effectively threefold, Lord. Really. Is, is the case a novel one? Is the issue a novel issue? I'm going to look at that. Second. Are the arguments that have been raised by the amici different to the other parties? And third, are the arguments likely to be of assistance to the court? Are they relevant? 
So let me start with novel. The issues. Uh, sorry, but okay. since I am not that court, which will deal with the relief, the main relief. How am I going to determine whether the the, 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 the submissions the Amiki intends to make will be of assistance to that court? Well, that's the danger of deciding whether they are right or wrong. But that they are relevant or not, you can certainly determine. We would put it at this level. The Constitutional Court has said a court must look at whether the issues that the Amiki wishes to raise would be of assistance. For instance, if my view is that that court should simply decide the matter on the question whether the Nole Prosecute applies to Miss Mahon or not. If it doesn't apply and then throw away the summons. And then the Amiki, how are they going to assist that court relating to that? Well, the two problems with the approach my Lord puts to me. The one is that I don't know that my Lord can prejudge, of course, what the main court is. But I have to deal with the question of how the submissions by the amici will assist that court relating to the relief that is sought in that court. Yes, but that relief is not limited to, of course, the Mali prosecution. It's limited. It's not limited in that way at all. It's about whether there is a Mali prosecute, whether there was an abusive process, and whether privacy rights... No, but immediately the court says this Mali prosecute does not apply to Ms. Mahoney. It doesn't have to deal with all the other issues. Yes, but my law doesn't know whether the court will say that. Well, I can see the Nolly Prosecutor and see whether it applies to Miss Mahone or not. I can see that it's before me. Well, my lord, my lord would then effectively have said that that's the end of Mr. Zoom's case because there isn't a Nolly Prosecutor certificate. But I, I, let us say for argument, I say so. Then why should I allow the Amiki still to, to be admitted? Because my lord might find that Mr. Zuma's legal team, the five strong legal team, disagrees with my lord emphatically. And we already know that, for instance, democracy in action, which is wanted to come in in this case as an amicus on the other side, they say there isn't a need for a nolly prosecute. So, Lord, it's a debate. Because apart from the nolly prosecute, then if you are still going to address me, that particular section of the NPA, does it apply to people who are not employed by the NPA? Well, Lord, I'm, I, my argument would be no. But I don't know whether... Then if you say no, the amicus, how are they going to assist that court relating to it? Well, Lord, I suppose the point is this. In every case that I've argued to be admitted as an amicus, there have been a number of things where you've assumed that there are points, good or bad, some may be emphatic or otherwise, and you may have a view, like I might have a view about some of the points that my lord has raised, which I think will be dispositive of the case. But I simply can't know until the case gets to the proper ventilation of the issues whether that will be dispositive of the case. So I suppose it's always the position well, but you run that risk if you allowed that the applications by the amici, they should be decided separately by a separate court. And then that court will have its view whether relating to the issues in that uh, main application, the relief that is sought there, what contribution or what value will be added by the submissions by the amici? No, we accept that, my Lord. And of course, my Lord might have views about the ultimate merits of the main case. My Lord might have those views. We would, as I say, say two things about it. The one is, my Lord could at best have prima facie views because there is the main case that is going to be determining these questions. But I need to determine how the submissions by the amici will assist that court in dealing with the relief that is sought before them. Yes, my Lord, but you, 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 in that context, as I say, cannot assume that there will be only one particular outcome in that case on the non prosecute point, for instance. It has to be the position that there are numbers of other points which might ultimately for that court... For instance, for instance, as I have indicated to you, if I'm of the view that there is a reasonable and probable cause that Mr. Zuma has shown to prosecute Ms. Mohan, and then I don't see the reason to deal with the question of abuse of process, the question of ulterior motives and all that, because he has established a case that there is a reasonable and probable cause to prosecute them. No, but, but that, that couldn't be the position. Well, that just highlights the, the importance of the debate that we're having. On the nolly prosecute point, if my lord thinks that there was a need for a nolly prosecute certificate before Mr. Zuma could initiate the prosecution, well, that might be the end of the case for Mr. Zuma. On the other side of it, if my lord is of the view that, well, there needed to be a reasonable and probable cause for Mr. Zuma to initiate the prosecution, and you think that there was, well, then that might be a, an argument that finds against. Uh, the uh, uh, Ms. Morn and, and Mr. Dunn. 
The point is this. Those are two arguments. You might be wrong on one or right on the other. You can't tell with respect which one will succeed. Well, if you say that issue I cannot apply and maybe uh, decide it based on my own view, then I might as well not deal with an application of an amic. I must simply allow any person uh, because I, I can't decide whether these submissions will off be will, will off any value relating to the relief in the main matter. No, my Lord, so I might as well allow any person to make whatever submissions they think they will make relating to the main matter. No, my Lord, with respect, you don't say it that way. You have got before you a case brought by an applicant who alleges on a number of different grounds that there's been an abuse. But, but, but you don't decide your ca a case which ca comes before you if you are a judge on all the grounds that are raised before you. You still have to look at the grounds and you see which grounds uh, you ca uh, uh, have merit and then decide the case on those grounds. Yes, my Lord, but as I'm saying, in this case, you're not the judge seized with determining the final issue of whether the review succeeds or not. The question before you is a different one. The question before you is, have we as the amici come to the court on the assumption that Mr. Zuma and Ms. Moore and Mr. Downer are going to have a fight about all of those issues. But are it, we as the amici going to assist? But it, in my experience, have you dealt with where the applications for the amici are dealt with by a separate court from the court that will deal with the main application? Yes, my lord. Yes. In fact, Ms. <laughs> Ms. Hoffmeyer will tell you about precisely such a case. She was in it. Um, and, and yes, indeed, that is exactly what uh, has happened in the past. My Lord, with respect to, it, it may have happened in this case. I'll tell you why. There's an oddity in this case. The amici, and you'll see from the process I told you about, we try to rush to get into court to have our amici admission heard and determined by the same court that was going to be carrying the matter on the 10th of October. As it turns out, for reasons which I don't need to tell my Lord, one of the, the judge who was meant to hear that matter, Justice Hugo, we couldn't hear it. But what happened then was that his Lordship, Mr. Justice Madonna, decided that there would be the main hearing that would take place in March before a full court, and this hearing before my Lord. Now, that is just, that's just happens to us. I, I thought that was proposed to uh, acting Judge President Madonna by the parties. No, it simply wasn't by my, no, it wasn't by my part. Lord. I think it was just one of those things to well, accommodate that. So, so what, what I can tell you emphatically, my Lord, and Ms. Hoffmeyer can elaborate. Because I can't decide the matter, for, of course, for the full court. But if the matter is before me, I have to apply my mind and see these submissions that are put forward by the applicants for the, to be admitted as an amici relating to granting the main relief, are they really going to add any value? Yes, but that's Lord, a, I have to decide that no, in order to grant the application or not. No, that's true, but my Lord can't preempt the outcome of those, those arguments in the main court. No, I'm not deciding the matter for the main court, but I'm deciding, I'm making a decision relating to that, relating to the application before me. No, but in, in doing so, if my Lord were to find, for example, and it, it's an important point to debate, if my Lord were to find, for example, that there was no need for a nolly prosecution, or, or there had to be a nolly prosecution, for example, yes. that would put an end to Mr. Zoom's case. And also an end to an application for, a, for, for somebody to be admitted as an amic? Yes, my Lord, and has expressed a view in that regard. I don't know whether that's what you, you will eventually find, and neither does Mr. Zuma's counsel. So I have to assume, and I also don't know whether that's what the full court decides. So let's assume that my Lord finds that now. Well, that doesn't put an end to the full court here. The full court will have all of these arguments before it. There will be three judges there. And I'd have to make a decision about whether there is something to that argument. And that's why I'm saying, my Lord, this is a very important thing to get right at this stage of what is the test. The test here is not for my Lord to determine whether the case is good or bad. The case is going to be determined as good or bad and whether the merits are good or bad for Ms. Moore and Mr. Dana and Mr. Zuma's opposition. That's going to happen later. Right now, it's a simple question of what are the issues? One, what are the issues in the case? And what is the relief that's planned? And assuming that those are going to be determined by a full court, will yeah. the amici assist? But what I'm putting to you, that's what Mr. Zuma is contending for, that he has established a reasonable and probable cause to prosecute, therefore raising these other issues, abuse of the process and 
ulterior motive, those things are irrelevant. No, but the Lord, how can you assume that he's proved that? I'm not assuming anything. I'm saying that is his contention. That's his contention, of course, but I, I made the point out at the outset. And then I'm saying because he's addressing that contention to me, yes. if he is correct in that contention, then if I'm of the view that he's correct, then why should I entertain people who want to talk about abuse of the process, the ulterior political motives? Well, because my Lord, as I've stressed, my Lord cannot determine the issue. It's lying ahead for determination by the final by the full court. My Lord can't finally make any views one way or the other. My Lord has to assume that there are arguments by the parties and that they will have merit or not. But that they are issues, in this case, there can be no debate. What are the issues? Whether there's a non prosecute certificate that was required. Whether there was an abusive process by Mr. Zuma in bringing the matter. And my Lord is effectively saying that, well, in that context, those issues my Lord's already got a firm view on. I'm saying that's with respect, getting the cart before the horse. In this matter, my Lord simply needs to ask the question, are there issues that are relevant? And are the amici likely to assist the court in determining these issues? So that's the first point. The second, the second point on this is that Mr. Zuma, and I'll get, I, want to, I don't want to get into the merits in great detail just yet, I'll come to them, but he's palpably wrong to say that there is a reasonable cause and a basis for him, and that's the end of the matter. That's his argument on it doesn't matter what the motive is. His argument is it doesn't matter what the motive is for the prosecution. But I've got a reasonable cause. No, but I haven't heard you to say that where it is established that there is a reasonable and probable cause to proceed to, uh, uh, even in that case, might be an abuse of the process of the court. Uh, how can it be an abuse of the process if it is established that there is a reasonable and probable cause to prosecute? No, my Lord, well, because I'm going to highlight for you that the Constitutional Court has said just the opposite. I'm going to take you through the Mineral Sands judgment. And I'm also going to remind my Lord that it's not in any way open to my Lord to determine on this case. As we saw, Ms. Morn is not even here. She's not represented in this case. Her advocates are not before this court. They're not making arguments to my Lord about the very points you're putting to me. The amici are here asking my Lord a much different question. On the assumption that there are proper debates to be had about those points, are we likely to assist the court in March? That's the test. So, my Lord, in that context, you need to be asking yourself a question, and it will assist my Lord in some of the debate that we've already had. Is this a novel case? Because, my Lord, is this a case which has appeared before the courts before, where there's been a private prosecution of a journalist in the context of a corruption reporting? And where there's been a leak, supposedly, of a document. There's been no such case before, Lord. This is a new area. And in that context, of course... Uh, sorry, just come again. You say where there is a, a private prosecution for the journalist for doing what? Where there's a, an allegation that the, there's a, a journalist who has breached privacy by reporting on a document. No, but that is not what is alleged here. What is alleged here is that he breached a particular provision of the NPA Act. Yes, but in that context, breached the rights of privacy. And then I can't understand again if he's not employed by the NPA and that provision applies to the employees of the P NPA because it refers to gaining that information during the course of work. And then yeah, how can she be yes. alleged to have contravened that provision? Well, my Lord, that's the debate to be had. One of the debates that we're going to have in this case before the full court is precisely what Section 41.6 means. We take my Lord's point. That well, it's, it, it's clear, you provision. can read it, yourself. it needs no debate. That well, it applies to the people who got that information during the course of their employment with the NPA. My Lord, that debate needs to be had, because that section has not been interpreted other than by His Lordship Mr. Justice Kuhn. Now, His Lordship Mr. Justice Kuhn, we accept, did it in an obitus statement. Are you saying that you need to debate it, interpret it, and include people who are not employed by NPA who got that information not in their cause of employment as, a, as employees of NPA. You mean you, need, you can interpret that section to, uh, you can extend it to, to, to cover such persons? Well, that's what, that's what Mr. Zuma put in. No, I'm asking you whether you support Mr. Zuma, that no, is right. No, we don't support him. But, <laughs> but we don't. But of course, we, we are saying that the debate about section 41.6 involves exactly that type of interpretive argument. You're, you're, you're I, I might be wrong, but if I'm firm of the view that Mr. Zuma in interpreting that section in that way is totally wrong, 
and therefore Ms. Mohan has got no case to answer. Why should I then allow the amici to Mama, do what? Then, then, then what I, I suspect we would ask you to do, and I suspect all of us as the council in this case would, would probably have to accept it then, my lord would have to express your views. And you might express your views firmly in one way or the other on certain of the aspects. You might have to do that if my lord felt inclined to. But well, in fact, to... I'm bound to do that because to decide whether the threshold has been met, I need to make a view relating to those. You issues. can make a view. My lord, we've, I've, I've accepted that you can come to a view. I've said to you, however, as well, with respect to Lord. Well, if, if, if it's a view, it's good as a finding because I'll make a decision depending on the view I take on that issue. Yes, it would be your view. We would, we would accept that. But it might be, you might say it will be my view, but it will be a view which has got an input in the outcome of the application. It would be a view, but it would be a view that my Lord <laughs> would have to be careful about because of what we've been debating. Well, that's why I say you are on a risk if you say the application for an amici must be heard by a separate court from the court that will hear the yeah, main application, yeah, and, then, and then you are running that risk. No, we accept them, Lord. We are in that position. Yes. I, 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 I can't do anything about that. I, I'm, not the, I'm not the master of how the matter came before my Lord. I'm highlighting for my Lord as well that my Lord's not the master of how the matter is going to end up. We're saying the case is going to end up being decided by three judges. Those judges are going to have to ultimately grapple with what all the parties have said about numbers of aspects of Ms. Morn's case and numbers of aspects of Mr. Zewitt's case. Now, if my Lord wants to express his view firmly about any one or other of those aspects, I can't, I can't tell my Lord, <laughs> I can't tell my Lord more than what I've already said. But it's more than expressing the view because my finding will be based on those views. Yes, my Lord, but what my view... So uh, it might be the f a decisive factor relating to the fate of the applications by the amic or by the applicants. Well, it sounds to me that but it seems you can't avoid it, and then you may proceed this. Yes. My Lord, we can't avoid it, but we must be careful of what my Lord is suggesting with respect. In as much as if my Lord's findings, in a way, preclude the range of arguments that not just me, but Ms. Hoffmeyer, Ms. Nongawana want to make for purposes of a future hearing. And it turns out that my Lord's disagreed with by the full court. They, they would have preferred to have all of us there in different ways. I understand you, but uh, that's exactly why I'm engaging you on these issues. No, because that. that's exactly the, the, what you, when you are saying that I must be careful on them. That's why I'm engaging uh, you on it so that I can hear your views relating. No, I'm, and I'm grateful for them, my Lord. And we, 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 let me try and summarize by saying quickly, this is just the consequence of how the procedure is shaken out. It's not my Lord's fault, it's not our fault. The second thing is my Lord cannot resist the reality, which is that there is a full court that will be hearing all of these issues. And if my Lord wants to thirdly make findings, of course you have to make findings. But those findings will be alive to the fact. But, but even Mr. Zuma is entitled, if he has raised objection and he is opposing by an application by the applicants, then I cannot simply close my view as the, and say I must not consider properly his opposition simply because there is still going to be a full court which will sit and hear the matter. He has raised these objections, and these objections, if they are relevant, they must be taken into account in deciding the applications. Yes, in the same way, however, my Lord, as obviously <laughs> the amici's views also have to be That's right. And, and, and recognizing that the panoply of those views are ultimately in this world, before my law, through the test. And the test is, is there a relevance to it? And is there a relevance to what? To what is likely to be argued before the full court? What is likely to be argued? The Lord has heard from all of the parties, very detailed heads on these aspects. And they all recognize that these are the issues that will be argued before the full court. I stress, the test before my Lord is not whether the parties are finally and emphatically right or wrong. It is whether the issues raised by them are relevant for that court's determination. And my Lord, in that context, it is critical then for me to reiterate that the issues before my Lord, and which will ultimately be before that court, are novel issues. So they're novel in lots of ways. And they're novel, obviously, for reasons which I don't need to reiterate. But what we know is that, at least in this context, we're talking about novelty in a world where you've got a slap suit judgment by the Constitutional Court three weeks ago. Does it apply? Does it apply? Is there a slap suit defense available that Ms. Morn would be entitled to raise 
or that the media applicants would be entitled to suggest the court was taking to account. That's one of the considerations. It's a brand new field of law. It's something which, with respect, three weeks ago, none of us knew the answer to, but the Constitutional Court's not given it. And as far as we can tell... But th this lab uh, issue that you are raising, it, it seems it comes into play if there is an allegation of abuse of the process. Yes, and of course that's one of the central allegations made by Ms. Wolf. If I'm of the view that that really is not an issue that should arise, then it's difficult to allow persons who want to raise arguments relating to that issue. My Lord, it's difficult to understand how that could be a finding by my Lord. In a case where Ms. Moore's affidavits highlight detailed grounds for contending abuse of process. She no. contends for abuse of process in multiple ways. She relies on multiple uh, um, uh, uh, judgments from different courts. She relies on the Phillips judgment no, but uh, yes, no, but I have indicated to you that uh, if I, I think on other issues other than this alleged abuse, Ms. Mohan should simply succeed. And then it seems to me, why should I allow parties who want to raise submissions relating to that issue? Well, my Lord, because the central feature of the case raised by Ms. Mohan is abuse of process. So it would be to deny her an opportunity and the courts that are going to have to determine that the benefit of parties who want to make arguments about the nature of an abuse of process. It would mean that my Lord thinks that there's a clean and clear-cut answer. But with respect, we know that's... that's I, that. I really can't see how I can entertain submissions relating to the abuse of the process if that particular provision of the NPA, according to me, does not apply to Ms. Moore. And of course, the other issues that there is no knowledge prosecute issued relating to Ms. Mao. Then why should I really allow people who want to debate the issue of uh, abuse of the process? My Lord, I think I've given the answer. Yes, we have already uh, no, debated it. it. But I, I do think then the answer in respect of an abuse of process point is very clearly articulated by the Constitutional Court. So my Lord, my Lord goes to the Mineral Sand Judgment, paragraph 90. Yes. yes. And my Lord, I've already made this submission to you. You might have firm views about non prosecution. You might have firm views about the wording of Section 41.6. But a central plank of Ms. Moore's case is that there's been an abuse of process by the private prosecution of her to Mr. Zuma. Now, my Lord, at paragraph 89 of that judgment, it's worthwhile just highlighting the quotation there. What does the court talk about? It says, there can be no doubt that every court is entitled to protect itself and others against an abuse of its process. Where it's satisfied with the issue of a subpoena in a particular case indeed constitutes an abuse, it is quite entitled to set it aside. The Constitutional Court there, my Lord, is citing what my Lord knows, Barnash, the leading authority on this. But then at paragraph 19, the court goes on. It says, a determination of what constitutes abuse of process will always be fact-specific, and there can be no all-encompassing definition of it. A close examination of all the relevant circumstances must be made. And Lord, that's, who's going to make a close examination of all those relevant circumstances? That's going to be the full court. They are being asked to, through Ms. Morn's affidavit, Look closely at what she says are the abuses. Similarly, in that court, Mr. Downer is going to complain about what he contests in fighting the summit. That is where it will take place. And the Constitutional Court has stressed there are different types of abuse of process. It's for the court to determine them closely by considering the relevant circumstances. The next thing that's important about that judgment rule is that it says... Abuse of process can, as stated, appear in different forms. You'll see that at paragraph 91. The Lord goes over the page, and it says, well, let me, let me start by pointing out what it says at paragraph 91 first. It says, it can, state, it can, as stated, appear in different forms. The first and arguably most common type of abuse is the use of the rules of court, for example, to delay a case or deliberately misemploy. Not our case, not yet, not an issue in our case, right? Second, it says, Lord, yeah, the second type of abuse is that of the vexatious litigant who repeatedly brings down meritorious cases. Not an issue in our matter. My Lord is with me. 
Then it says the third type of abuse is where there's an illegality, arrest, and so on. And then it's the fourth type of abuse. You see at the bottom of paragraph 92, it says, is where combat plays a central, indispensable role. Cases like malicious prosecution or the integrity of a private prosecution fall into, category, into this category. Let me stop there. That is precisely what Ms. Mourn's case is. She's complained that there's been an abusive process, central theme of her affidavit, and that that abusive process has taken place and it compromises the integrity of the private prosecution that's been launched against her. No, but you, you cannot over, I mean, overemphasize that Ms. Mahon has raised the issue of the abuse of the process. If you read her papers, she says, I've got, really, there's no case against me. So that's why she's claiming there's an abuse of the process. Well, that's she doesn't say, so that's why I say, if on those grounds she is correct, mm -hmm. then it seems to go back and investigate the question of the abuse is neither here nor there. No, my Lord, because look at what the Constitutional Court says next. It says, you, my Lord has just put the point to me that, well, we've got to look at Ms. Morn's case in the way that she's framed it. But we as the amici are not, we're not limited to what Ms. Morn has said. We want no, to but what I'm time. saying, Ms. Morn, she says that there is an abuse of the process against her because there is no case against her. That's, that's what she one, says. No, Lord, with respect, that's to myopically read her papers. That's one of the things she says. She says there's an abusive process for many reasons. Her, her papers are comprehensive. Not only that there's no merit against her, my lord, also the manner in which it's been employed, also the fact that it's trying to chill other journalists in that context, also the fact that there's been abuse against her. But in her papers, I haven't s seen her making a vehemence that even if there was a case against her, it will still be an abuse of the process to proceed against. I haven't seen her making those vehemence. No, my lord, but that's, the, well, that's why what I'm about to read you is important. So paragraph 93, the Constitutional Court says, these various forms, though often referred to as abusive process, do not have one common feature. Not all of them ought really to be called abusive process. And then critically, there's another species of abuse, though, that does, in my view, deserve the nomenclature abusive process. It's in the form of what we have before us in this matter, said the Constitutional Court. And read what it says, Lord, in paragraph 94. It says, hypothetically, a plaintiff may sue for defamation in circumstances where there are very little, if any, prospects of establishing a case for defamation. In other words, it merits a plea. The defendant is in a position to show that the defamation action is being brought not to vindicate the plaintiff's right to a good name and reputation, but to silence the defendant or to burden the defendant in a manner that causes grave harm to the defendant's right of expression and the public interest that is being served by the expression, with the likelihood that the assumed action will have that negative effect. And then it says the court is important. It says in that instance, court process is not being used to resolve a genuine dispute, but rather is employed to achieve a result that undermines the rights in the Constitution. Says the Constitutional Court, one may call this, for present purposes, abusive litigation. And then you'll see what it says. It would self-evidently not be easy to establish a case of abusive litigation, but if one is able to do so, abusive, abusive litigation would have nothing to do with the rights of access to court. And then it says, instead, it would simply be about the use of court processes and associated legal costs as a means to an impermissible end likely to cause appreciable damage to fundamental rights. Said the court, it's about motive and consequences. And then you'll see, my lord, the Constitutional Court sets out what the test would be for that type of abusive process, which is what my clients, the media and the are contending, should be what the full court sees in play here. But you mustn't forget it. You said it yourself. You say those, uh, uh, it applies instances where there is no genuine desire to resolve a dispute. Yes, my lord, but how, as the Constitution... So where it is shown that indeed there is a contravention and therefore there is a, a reasonable and probable cause to prosecute, then one can say there is no gene and desire to resolve that dispute. No, my lord, you could. Because you could say that it's dressed up, as the Constitutional Court has just read to you in paragraph 94, it could be dressed up as a case. Which no, suggests it, no, it can't be dressed up as a case because for you to arrive at a, a conclusion that there is a reasonable and probable cause to prosecute, it must be based on the facts. So you, it can't be dressed up. No, my lord, but you, you can say that there are facts that suggest that there's a reasonable and probable cause. But of course, Ms. Morn says that there isn't. There is no basis for that. Her argument, for example, is that the Section 41.6 interpretation is entirely incorrect and that the particular 
in this case, documents were already part of the public record. So her argument is that there is no merit to the case. And she said, I have never published anything that wasn't already, published, uh, already publicly available. So there's no merit to the case. That's her argument. My Lord doesn't know. No, but as I understand the contravention, that section says what is an offense is not to publish, is to somebody within the NPA, he discloses information. So I have already indicated to you my problems regarding Ms. Mahon, who is not within the, the NPA. Yeah, but she's not here. She hasn't, she, would, she hasn't had an opportunity to have that debate with Mahon. She'll have that opportunity to But we have to look at her papers. She has filed all the papers relating to the relief that she's seeking. And she has made all the events that she's, she wants to rely on. Yes. So we can't simply say she's not here, she is not here, so we cannot look at what averments or what case she's making. No, my lord, of course you can look at her averments. But you would have thought that if my lord is going to be having a debate, a full throated debate about whether there's a section as interpreted as my lord suggests or otherwise, or whether her case has been made out or not, that would be something that she would have an opportunity to have. Well, in her paper, she referred to the particular section, and it's there, I've read it. Yes, my lord, and that section. Now but that again, on that, you know, we'll hear Mr. Mpofu relating to the interpretation of that section. How do they interpret it to include Ms. Mahon? Yes. So I don't think we can take that debate any My further. Lord has heard Mr. Popper's interpretation of that. You've read it in his Lordship, Mr. Justice Quinn's judgment. And but I will Lord. engage with him. You'll address me. Yeah, no, you will. Yeah. But I, I'm, I'm answering your Lordship's question. He has already given his interpretation of that section. He's given it to Lord, his Lordship, Mr. Justice Quinn. These arguments that you'll hear from Mr. Popper, my little friend, have already been put to Mr. Justice Quinn. And Mr. Justice Quinn, we accept, albeit in arbiter terms, said that he didn't accept those arguments. So, my lord, my lord has a view. Now, as far as I understand the judgment of uh, uh, my brother Kuhn, it, it dealt mainly with the disclosure of confidential information. But here, as I'm saying, I'm looking at the contravention, the alleged contravention of that particular section of the NP. Well, my lord, you, you, you're dealing with that interpretation, and the interpretation of that section obviously raises a constitutional issue. It raises the balance between the rights to publish, the rights to privacy, and obviously the criminal law context. No, no, it doesn't raise all those issues. It simply says if you're with the NPA and you get some, during the course of your employment, you gain some information, before you can disclose that information, you must have permission. So all those other issues, they don't arise. No, my lord, with respect, the Supreme Court of Appeal disagrees with you emphatically. So my lord, if you want to have that debate about the interpretation of the section, and that might be helpful to situate what we're talking about. Then have regard to what the SCA has already said on this point. I tomorrow. still don't understand it because the way I understand the section, my interpretation favors Ms. Mahon. You want to persuade me otherwise? No, my lord. Then no, let no, us no. not debate that. Maybe Mr. Mpofu will debate it with me. No, I, I, I've accepted and I've embraced my lord's <laughs> yes, notice. But it that seems you want to argue no, the point no, 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 and no, persuade no, me lord. otherwise. I'm, I'm, I've embraced my lord's interpretation. Yes, and then let us leave it like that. Mr. Poof will take it up with me. All I will say then, my lord, just in closing with my embrace, and I warmly embrace my lord's <laughs> interpretation, is to say that my, lord, my lord's interpretation is a, on an on a ordinary wording of the section. Am I, am I understanding my lord correctly? You've read the section and that's how you read it. That's its grammatical meaning. And I'm with my lord. I embrace it. Mr. Mpofu might have something different to say about what he sees about it. But this is the important point. My Lord, that court in March is going to have to decide, if my Lord says that that's your interpretation, is there anything to support that interpretation, aside from the grammatical wording that my Lord's put to me? And yes, there would be, my Lord. One of the arguments raised by my clients, nobody else has raised it, is the interpretation of that section which best gives its constitutional purpose, and it's the Maharaj decision of the SCA. In our heads of argument, we referenced the SCA decision, and the SCA decision specifically confirms that there is a constitutional interpretation that can be given to that particular section, which would assist my lord, and it would assist the full court in saying that my lord's grammatical reading of the section also happens to be consistent with its constitutional purpose. And that would be so, the, so the SCA uh, just conveyed to me, you say in Maharani's case, Ma Ma Maharaji's Ma case, Ma yes, what, uh, what interpretation was given to that provision? Well, my lord, you'll see it in our heads at page 32. Yes. My lord just put to me that that section doesn't engage section 16 or, or any of these rights. So the same in your heads page? 
Page 33 of our head, yes. and it's paragraph 69. Yes, what does it say? It says, in Maharaj, the SCA was called on to interpret that section. It confirmed that section 316 constituted a limitation on the right to freedom of expression contained in section 16 of the Constitution. It limited freedom of the media, and also the correlative right of the public to receive and impart information. And the SCA held that the NDPP, you see in that case it was the NDPP, here it's the private prosecutor, in exercising its discretion must strike the appropriate balance in each case between its purpose, securing the integrity of the criminal justice system and upholding the freedom of expression. And the SCA expressly said that it did not uphold a blanket ban on publication by the media. My Lord, I'm making a simple point. I'm agreeing with my Lord that that section on its ordinary terms suggests that Ms. Morn is not in trouble at all. But, but, the, but sorry, in that interpretation given to the section by the SCA, where does it say that people who did not gain that information in the course of their employment with the NPA, those persons are bound by the section? No, it doesn't say that, my Lord. But what I'm saying to you is it says on a different, it, it's making a different point about that section. But that is my interpretation of the section which favors Ms. Manon. Yes, no, I'm... And I'm, you, I thought you said the SCA in interpreting the section differed from me. No, my Lord, I didn't say that. I said, my Lord said to me, the interpretation of that section doesn't engage any of the rights. Because I was saying what the importance of this interpretation around section 41.6 is that it's a constitutional no, no. question. I do understand. Maybe as far as the employees of the NPA can be said to engage those uh, issues. But what I'm saying, I can't see how one can interpret that section that it uh, applies to persons who are not in the employment of the NPA. Yes, my Lord. And one of the reasons you would also find that is through what Maharaj says. You would want to avoid a constitutional outcome which says that there is a blanket ban on the publication of important details that the, the public would wish to know about. That's the simple point we're making. So, my Lord, I was simply engaging with you when you said this section 41 doesn't engage any of these rights. It does. Maharaj okay. tells me. So, that's in that context. Lord. So, let me then... I, I, I've been, we've been debating the point around what my Lord may or may not find in the context of... Um, Mr. Zuma's case and lying ahead for the full court, how my Lord will deal with that, and that we're in a, a slightly um, unfortunate bifurcated world. But we are where we are. And my Lord has to recognize, as I've said, that my Lord has got one test before you. That's the test that we are asked to meet as the amici. Yes. And that is, is this a novel case? There can be no debate it's a novel case. We've explained to you numbers of ways it's a novel case. And I've just been reading to you from the Constitutional Court judgment in I, 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 Mineral Senate. I think one will say it's a novel case if one thinks, for purpose of this case, the issue of, of uh, the slap defense, the issue of uh, abuse of the process are relevant. Yes. They need to be determined. And then one can say it's a novel case in that context. But if one is of the view that those are side issues, they need not be uh, raised in this case, and then there's no novelty. In well, the Lord, we, we, as, we made our submissions as to why we think it's clearly the case that there's an abusive process at the heart of what we're on. And I was stressing for my Lord when I referenced paragraph 90, 91 and 92 of Mineral Sands that the Constitutional Court has been very clear. It has identified that there are different types of abuses of process. As I said to you, Ms. Morn's abuse of process, if one wants to call it that, from her papers, falls into the remit of effectively an abuse of a private prosecution. I've highlighted for you that the Constitutional Court has said that there's a very different type of uh, a slap suit. Okay, I, I, I think you are wrapping up. I allowed you more time because I was engaging with you, and I think this engagement will also no, somehow okay. inform well assist, the Lord. other council who will argue the matter yes. after you. No, it may well assist, But Lord. please, if you can wrap up. Yes, my Lord. So let me, let me finish by saying that in, re in regard to the actual features of this matter, concerning Mr. Zuma's private prosecution of Ms. Ms. Morgan. What we've highlighted for my Lord is, and we've done this in detail in our heads, there are numbers of important aspects which we say the full court will have to think about and will look to assistance from Amiki on, whether it's us or Democracy in Action or from the Helen Susan Foundation. Assume for a moment, my Lord, that there isn't one clear and obvious answer, as my Lord suggests, on whether it's Nolly Prosecute or, 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 or anything else on the interpretation. There, is no, there can be no question that there are a number of important features of what we want to say, which would be of assistance. I've highlighted in our heads, there are international law instruments that speak to the problem of female journalists 
and that the courts need to be particularly vigilant in protecting female journalists in this type of context. And that the Constitutional Court is stressed, and the judgments we've referenced, that these are the types of things that a court will... Are you suggesting that female journalists, they need to be protected differently from male journalists? Yes, we will. But precisely because of the international instruments that we've highlighted. My Lord, if you've read our heads on this and the reports which we reference, we make it very clear that the UN Secretary General and the Special Rapporteur and the UN organisations have, have deliberately called on states, and including my Lord sitting as a representative of the So, so are you saying in this case if Ms. Mahon was a male, uh, you would not have raised these issues? No, I wouldn't have raised them. No. Because I've read to you paragraph 90 of the, the Constitutional Court's judgment, which says these types of cases must be dealt on their specific facts and what are the relevant issues to those cases. The other specific facts, Malone, you, you can't run away from those facts, none of us can, is Ms. Moore. The facts highlight that she has not only been ultimately privately prosecuted, but that that has given rise to multiple threats against her. They're in the papers, they haven't been in any way contested by Mr. Zuma. There have been threats against her online, and those threats have now uh, and elevated to the point of being offline threats. So that's a fact. What is the relevance of that fact? The relevance is not just that she's a woman. That relevance is constitutionally and internationally important. And the Lord, we've stressed this in great detail in our heads, and I commend for my Lord to have regard to what we've said in that. Yeah, yes. My Lord, in, the, in that, let me, let me snapshot it. The Constitutional Court has said, in the judgments we've highlighted, that courts have a particular duty to be sensitive to protecting women when they are performing their functions and they are subjected to any forms of threats and abuse. The Constitutional Court has, in other words, said that women are entitled to be treated differently, my Lord, to men. Why? Because they're particularly vulnerable. The second point that we've stressed in our heads is that the international law of learning, you remember, my Lord, I read to you the very last source in the Constitutional Court's judgment at footnote 92. That's just one of the sources that we've referenced, and I told you that we were prescient in doing so. That source at 92 is the information note on SLAPS of the United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Rights to Freedom of Peaceful Assembly and Association, and there are numbers of other reports we highlight. What, is, what do those reports say? In great detail, Lord, we've set this out in our heads. And those particular reports stress that in this world that we are now facing, in the latest years, the numbers of abuses and threats against women have, have ratcheted up to such an alarming extent, particularly in, rega in regard to female journalists, particularly in cases where female journalists are reporting on corruption cases, and particularly in cases where female journalists are ultimately threatened with a form of slap lawsuit. Well, how could it get any more relevant? Yes. And in that world, the international law that we've cited has gone further than, the Lord puts it to me, well, would this have been a, an argument I'd have advanced if it was a male reporter? No, I wouldn't have. Do you know why, my Lord? Because there isn't a report by the United Nations Human Rights Council that's adopted a resolution on the safety of journalists that deals with men. It's a report that deals with women. Why? Because they are vulnerable. And so the UN Special Rapporteur in particular... I, I thought in our case we, we follow the principle that there is equality before no, the law. My, my Lord, of course we do. But equality um, is, is not... Equality is not... You, you don't equalize down. You equalize up. And in our context, these are female journalists who have, in this particular context, suffered a particular combination of violence and attacks. And we've said it for you in that particular section of our heads. I'll give it to you at page 27 of our heads. So you are distancing yourself from Mr. Down. No. Mr. <laughs> no, no, I'm joking. <laughs> no, no, not at all. I, I, I vouch for this, Mum. I vouch for this. Ms. Hoffmeyer will stand up and she will, on behalf of Mr. Downer, not say a single word against what we've attempted to say is important in relation to Ms. Moore. So the, the contextual fact I stressed, and it's in our heads, and I need to give it to you, my Lord, because you, you with respect, need to have regard to it, because it's the international law that the Constitutional Court said is particularly helpful. 
It's at our heads page 27 under the head. Second contextual factor, global trends relating to attacks on journalists and specifically women journalists. And my lord, I'm going to read to you because of the debate we've had at paragraph 55.1. This is now, 2022, the Joint Declaration on Freedom of Expression and Gender Justice adopted by the Special Rapporteurs and Representatives of Freedom of Expression in 2022. My lord will see it. It's <coughs> cited in the footnote. It expresses deep concern about online gender-based violence, and then it speaks about it at 55.1.2. It condemns online attacks and harassment of women journalists as one of the most serious contemporary threats to the safety of journalists and freedom of the press. And what does it recommend? Well, it recommends that states develop and implement integrated prevention, protection, monitoring, and response mechanisms to ensure their safety. You're one of those mechanisms, my lord. The Constitutional Court is one of those mechanisms. And how does it protect them? It protects them by recognizing the slap suits that I've been speaking about in context where there's an abuse of a process in order to chill publications by female journalists. So we say that with a certain amount of rectitude, if I can use that word, because it's right. Yes. So well, those are our submissions as to the relevance. There are numbers of other points that Mr. Zuma and our learned friends Democracy in Action have attempted to raise. I'll listen to see what they have to say. Yes, about and then maybe you can deal reply. with them in reply. Yeah. Yes. Those, those are submissions for now. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think Ms. Hofmeyer will have to take lunch break and then we can resume at quarter to two. Indeed, my lord. And then if I may, just before we adjourn, I, we did have a discussion between council uh, before we reconvened. And it was going to be our proposal that uh, Mr. Ngawana goes next because he is also representing an amicus in the Morn matter. So our proposal would be he goes next after lunch and then I will do the third argument for the amici applicants because mine relates only to Mr. Downer's matter. Okay, uh, thank you, thank you. And again, it will give me an opportunity to uh, peruse Mr. Galona's uh, papers during the lunch break. Thank you, and then Lord. we can start with him at quarter to two. Thank you, my Lord. Okay, thank you. The quarter James.